the first institution to come up is all in institute of medical sciences new delhi thank you thank you one and all we are team aims and i am manohar to my left is dr anish and to my right is dr chaube so we'll be presenting an in uh, interesting case which we have diagnosed in our institute so our patient is a 47 year old male a resident of bihar and a manual laborer by occupation presented with chief complaints of weight loss for the last 12 months progressive dyspnea on exertion for the last 10 months left upper limb pain and weakness for the last 2 months and bilateral pedal edema for the last 1 month going out of the history of present illness he presented with complaints of weight loss which was unintentional and significant of about 15 kilos over the period of 1 year it was not associated with any anorexia vomiting or diarrhea there was no history of fever or cough associated with the weight loss after 2 months of initial period of weight loss he also started having dyspnea on exertion which was insidious in onset gradually progressed to initially it was of nyha class 2 but it progressed to a uh, nyha class 3 over the next 10 months and now he has occasional episodes of orthopnea as well since the last two months he started having left upper limb pain as well as weakness this pain was persistent and it was radicular type of pain involving more on the medial aspect of arm and forearm the weakness involved both proximal and distal muscles the onset of distal muscles was slightly earlier than that of the proximal muscles and since the last one month he started having pedal edema initially it used to resolve on lying down but since the last 15 days he says that it stays even after overnight sleep this was not associated with any decreased urine output or abdominal distension during the entire history there was no history of angina palpitations syncope or history of jaundice or abdominal distension there were no bleeding manifestations associated with this in the past history there was no history of tuberculosis in the past nor any high risk behavior there was no history of diabetes hypertension thyroid disease there was no history of asthma or any allergy there was no significant family history in the family members there was no other heart disease in them in personal history he was a non smoker and he doesn't consume any alcohol he has normal normal bowel and bladder habits and he doesn't have any high risk behavior so summarizing the history he began with weight loss uh, one year back and then he started having dyspnea which progressed from nyha class 2 to class 3 and now having occasional episodes of orthopnea since the last two months he started having left upper limb pain as well as weakness the pain was radicular in origin and he had started having pedal edema for the last one month after summarizing the history we were not able to arrive at a single cardiovascular diagnosis rather we want to present a syndromic diagnosis in the form of patient presenting with dyspnea with orthopnea as well as pedal edema with associated weight loss and radicular pain or radiculopathy so we would like to consider a systemic disease with cardiac involvement with respect to systemic disease because he had significant weight loss which was unintentional and significant over a period of an year with no history of fever or cough we would like to keep the systemic disease to be a malignancy more than an infective etiology and the malignancies in this age group would be a lymphoma or a malign considering the radicular pain which was only associated in the left upper limb we would like to consider a pancos tumor as well or any other primary cardiac tumor like angiosarcoma or lymphomas which had had an extra cardiac spread though there was no fever we would still like to consider india being an endemic currently tb as a possibility and hiv can also present in the similar manner we would though unlikely and he is a male we still want to consider an autoimmune etiology we doesn't want to rule it out totally and the sarcoidosis or some sort of vasculitis can present in similar manner with respect to the cardiac involvement and the nature of progression of disease we we would like to consider a pericardial disease like pericardial effusion or ccp we would also like to consider myocardial diseases especially on the background of a systemic disease we would like to think of infiltrative cardiomyopathy or a myocarditis later progressing into dcmp or some systemic disease like muscular dystrophies with associated cardiac involvement though again it still uh, it remains a lower possibility considering the progression of disease was only a period of one year and again there was no history of fever or any other manifestation suggestive of infective endocarditis but still considering that he had weight loss with background history suggestive of a cardiac illness we would not rule out infective endocarditis in this case with this uh, uh, differential diagnosis after history we examined the patient was one second is there any history of paroxysmal alternate dyspnea because no, sir, there was dyspnea. there was no history of pnd sir there was history of orthopnea any history of palpitation no sir no history of palpitations or angina or any other uh, or having, has he received any drugs for any other illness in no, the sir, past he, no he did not receive any medication sir he sought our uh, he, he directly came to us and it was a it was his first presentation
or any history of having uh, tested positive for COVID? No, sir. No history of COVID. Sir, no history of COVID, sir. Okay. So with this, uh, we examined the patient and he was conscious, alert to time, place and person. He had BMI, which suggests that he is underweight and malnourished. He had a pulse, which suggested tachycardia. It was regular, good volume. There was no special character or any delay. Blood pressure in the upper limb was 116 by 80 and uh, in lower limb was 110 by 78. There was no evidence of any orthostatic hypotension. He was mildly tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 20 per minute. He was ephebrile and his saturation was 99% at room air. On, on, on examination, he had fullness as seen here in the left supraclavicular fossa. JVP was raised. It was 7 cm above the sternal angle. Both A wave and V wave were seen and there was a prominent A wave. The distance were normal. Kusmol sign was positive. He had generalized lymphadenopathy. He had cervical axillary and inguinal lymph nodes, which were of significant size. They were non-matted. They were hard in consistency. They were non-tender, non-inflamed, mobile, and the skin overlying skin is normal. He had pitting uh, pedal edema. There was no paler cyanosis, ictus, or clubbing. He had good oral hygiene. The one more significant uh, uh, finding which we found was anhydrosis of the left side of the face. There was no ptosis, meiosis, or anaphthalmos. On inspection, chest was symmetrical. Trachea was in midline. Apical wind impulse was seen below and two centimeter outside the left nipple. RV pulsations were seen in the left lower sternal border. There was no scars, sinuses, fistula, or dilated veins. On palpation, the inspectory findings were confirmed. The apex beat was in the left sixth intercostal space, just lateral to the mid clavicular. It was well localized and heaving in character with medial retraction, suggestive of an LV type of apex. There was grade one parasternal heave. S2 was not palpable. On percussion, left heart border corresponded to the apex. Right heart border, we were not able to ascertain properly that the right heart dullness actually extended up to the right midclavicular line uh, and beyond. And the second intercostal space was resonant. There was hepatic dullness in the fifth intercostal space and liver span was 17 centimeter. On auscultation, S1 was normal, S2 was normal intensity and normally split with a normal P2. There was no S3, but there, there was an LV S4. There were no additional sounds. A medium pitched grade three by six early systolic murmur he has heard in the left lower sternal border. It was best heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope in the supine position. There was no radiation of the murmur, nor the, in, there was uh, any associated with respiration. There were no other murmurs which we were able to hear. With respect to the CNS examination, pupils were reactive, plantas were flexor, motor examination because he had left upper limb weakness. Tone was reduced on the left side. Power was reduced on the left side with the hand grip suggestive of 75%. And elbow and shoulder movement showed a power of four by five. Deep tendon reflexes as well were reduced on the left side. All of these suggest to have a lower motor type of weakness. Lower limb and other right upper limb were normal. Abdominal examination was soft, non-tender. There was hepatomegaly as described previously with a liver span of 17 centimeter and liver was palpable four centimeter below the right costal margin. It was firm, non-tender and non-pulsatile. There was no splenomegaly nor any free fluid. Testicular examination was done because he had left supraclavicular fossa fullness and it was normal. There was no tenderness nor any mass in the test, in the scrotal, scrotal region. Respiratory system examination revealed right inframammary area, which showed coarse crepitations with bronchial breath sounds. There were decreased or absent breath sounds on the left and right side, especially in the inter, inter and infrascapular region. In the same regions, a dull note was found on percussion. All this probably suggesting that there is pleural effusion bilaterally and the coarse crepitation with bronchial breath sounds would indicate an underlying consolidation. So examination summary, the positive points were left supraclavicular fossa fullness, tachycardiac tachypne patient with an elev elevated JVP with a prominent A wave and a Kutsmal sign being positive. He had generalized lymphadenopathy and left-sided anhydrosis. Apex was LV type heaving, which was down and out. And there was a grade one parasternal heave with an LV S4. There was hepatomegaly, there was left-sided, in fact, bilateral pleural effusion with a right-sided consolidation and an element type of left upper limb weakness. Again, there were multi-system involvement with cardiovascular involvement. With the findings that which are suggestive of all these things, we have considered with the systematic disease which he is having might be a lymphoma, considering the hard lymph nodes which were generalized. Though we couldn't rule out totally by history and examination the possibilities of sarcoidosis or amyloidosis is secondary to underlying malignancy. There was mild TR, moderate PVH, mild PAH. There was evidence suggestive of left ventricular dysfunction and the patient was in congestive heart failure in NYHA class three in normal sinusism. There was as well left-sided pleural effusion with right-sided consolidation. And there was generalized lymphadenopathy with less sympathetic chain involvement, probably because of the compression which he had because of the lymph nodes. 
causing left upper limb motor type of weakness as well as anhydrosis of the left upper limb. With this provisional diagno clinical diagnosis after examination, we started investigating the patient. Initial ECG was suggested to off. Wait, wait. Hello, we want to do it like an exam, right? The investigation yeah. should come later, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so Dr. Manjunath, can you start? Yeah. Yeah. So here, uh, the, you said the good volume pulse, right? Yes, sir. What is the pulse pressure? Pulse pressure was 40, sir. About uh, 30, less than 30? 116 by 80, sir. 36, sir. So normally, uh, that is a normal pulse pressure, no? So is it normal volume or a good volume? Oh, sir, we meant normal volume only, sir, actually. It was not a high volume pulse. It was a normal volume. Because good volume, many a times we uh, prefer. See, other thing, uh, we just wanted to know in this case, uh, uh, you said uh, prominent A waves and Kusmal sign. So how do you explain that? Sir, uh, well, probably the can you tell us what is exactly the Kusmal sign? Kusmal sign is actually an inspiratory increase in the JVP, sir. It occurs mostly in conditions where the RV is not able to accommodate the excess amount of blood which happens during inspiration. So in the conditions like either a restriction because of restricted cardiomyopathy or an extra cardiac constraints of pericardial disease like CCP. Can How cause... often they go together? Prominent A waves and Kusmal sign? Sir, they usually don't, sir. Uh, because the Kusmal is more likely to be in CCP and the prominent A wave is more likely to be in a restrictive condition. Uh, so they often shouldn't go together, sir. But here we had is it. Is it a paradox or it is it, what is true paradox? I mean, is Kusmal sign is a paradox? Or what is true paradox? With respect, sir, is it with respect to pulse? Uh, normally, during paradox? inspiration, what happens to JVP? The inspiration, it, the JVP should fall, sir. Yes, sir. So here what happens? It, it is actually increasing with inspiration. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So it's a paradox, sir. Yes, sir. We, we would have expected a fall, but here rather there was an increase in JVP with inspiration. Yeah, I think there is a discrepancy between uh, this JVP A wave and your small sign, isn't it? Right. So basically, what does A wave mean? A, a wave, prominent A wave here means that the atrium is contracting against a non compliant ventricle. It would just be similar to an S4. It, it's just that the, the atrium is contracting against a non-compliant, probably hypertrophied ventricle or a in ventricle. Most important, of course, uh, you said uh, whenever there is some uh, mass in the clavicular region or uh, is it an SVC? Is there any SVC obstruction? Sir, I we were able to see a pulsatile JVP, sir, one and uh, no, no, it was again, it was not a bilateral swelling, rather, it was more of a unilateral swelling, specifically located in the supraclavicular posa. So, we were not considering SVC obstruction mainly because of the pulsatile nature of the JVP. Right. Say so another thing, another discrepancy you said, uh, heaving apical impulse, right? Yes, sir. And an S4. You tell us what are the causes of heaving LV apical impulse and S4. And there is no murmur, right? Except for early yes, system. Here, murmur. Here, murmur. Here, murmur. So what is the, uh, can you elaborate on the murmur? Yes, sir. Early. Is it grade two, grade three? It was, grade a, three. it was a medium pitch grade three by six early systolic murmur, sir. It was heard in the left lower sternal border. It was best heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope and supine position. There was no radiation of the murmur. Actually with respiration, there was no change of the uh, intensity of the murmur, nor with leg raising or with inspiration, there was change. But so still where concerned. Is the, where is this genesis of this murmur? Sir, we were thinking this might be a TR murmur, sir. Early systolic. Probably a low pressure TR murmur, sir. Okay. Other thing, the LVS4 is present and uh, there is uh, heaving apical impulse. So, what are the situations where we get that? Again, so, yes, sir. So, LVS4, as we thought, it was it, it represents a usually a non dilated hypertrophic ventricles and a heaving apex again uh, would indicate a pressure overload type of state. So, one, it could be uh, suggestive of a LV outflow tract obstruction where both of them can be present, like in aortic stenosis or HCM, or it in cases like uh, uh, I mean, no hypertension hi and hypertension, sir, definitely, yes, sir. Hypertension in the post M immediately post MI can also cause similar state. Uh, and uh, here, sir, the other thing was probably this there is a down and out apex, which with and it is of LV type of nature. 
uh, this thing was not very clearly uh, understandable by, by, by us why there was cardiomegaly. Usually an LV S3, L, S4 goes with a non-dilated ventricles. So this we were not very clear, but uh, again, uh, it might also represent that the heaving apex could represent a, a, <laughs> If you are thinking of an infiltrative disease or a restrictive cardiomyopathy, yes, see, definitely S3 is also an important component. Yes, sir. So that you are telling uh, because that they don't go together. No, no S3 is said, no but LV S4 is present. Yes, sir. So and there is no outflow. This early systolic murmur is nothing to do with the outflow murmur, right? No, sir. No, sir. We were considering this as a TR moment. And probably the respiratory, the lack of respiratory availability, the lack of inspiratory increase in the murmur. We we thought it could be uh, either because the patient might be in RV dysfunction, so which which can also where there can be absence of increase in the uh, in intensity with inspiration. Any pericardial rub or anything? No, sir. No pericardial rub or no pericardial knock, sir. What was your pulse rate? Sorry, sir? 100. Pulse rate. Pulse rate was 100 per minute, sir. There was <clears tachycardia. throat> between S3 and S4, all these things, it's possible with 100. Sir, uh, one, yes, sir. Initially, we had this doubt whether this was S3 or S4. One thing which was like, there was a prominent, definite prominent A wave. Uh, and uh, can you go to the your diagnosis, all the differential on history? You yes. had this four symptomatology, right? Yes, sir. You had four chief complaints. Why that you brought in malignancy, except for weight loss, what is there? Can it all be tuberculosis, iotoarthritis? Yes, sir. It can definitely be, sir. The only thing so was... Where did consider that at all in the history? Yes, sir. We, we have considered... How it will be? What, how tuberculosis can affect the LV to give you orthopnea and dyspnea? Uh, sir, infiltrative myopathy, cardiomyopathy can happen with even TB as well. It can yes, cause... Tuberculosis, myocarditis. So, all this taken together, why have you put... You have not given a history of swellings. Though there is such a prominent left... But he you have not give you have given a negative history of no history of swellings. Everywhere, whenever you talk about tuberculosis, you have to give a history of lymph node swellings. Yes. You should ask for those, no? whether he has palpated any swellings anywhere. Yes, sir. Actually, we have asked it, sir. You, yes, yes. Though there was a prominent swelling in the that, I thought he did not actually come up with it. Only, only even my after first diagnosis, you are bringing in a van coast. Why the pain in the left arm? Why is it not a vascular pain? Yes, sir. It could be a vascular pain, sir, but typical pain, which was like on the left side, medial aspect in the arm and forearm, and it was typically radicular in nature. He speaks of electric shock, shooting like sensation. Uh, so, all suggestive of some radicular or myocarditis. Myocarditis going into a cardiomyopathy. Suppose, we, whatever, infective, some infective etiology and that. And can it be an embolus going from the LV there? Yes, His orthopnic has got PND, and can it be an embolus there? It could be an embolus, sir, but again, so, I mean, it's not a, such an acute presentation yet. Can it be that kind of a thing? Yes, sir. Could be, sir, but again, uh, weakness, which was gradually progressing over a period of two Are months. You tell me why on the history taking all that, why malignancy comes as a first choice and not why not infective inflammatory disorders as the first sir, choice. One, yes, sir, one thing which we were like very sure was what he says, because he's a, he's a absence of fever. He says he never had fever and he says that he actually measured fever. Constitutional, every time symptoms, and constitutional and symptoms are there, correct? Yes, sir, definitely, sir. That's why we... we what do you get in tuberculosis? You have to get fever always? No, sir. It's not mandatory that he, he should have fever. And especially considering after examination, he had lymph node involvement. Lymph node TB is known to have less chance of fever than a pulmonary TB. So, yes, sir, definitely the possibility still it remains. Why why infective inflammatory is not the first cause? Why you came to malignancy? Just because of the weight loss, is it? Significant weight loss of 15 kgs, yes, sir. And also a compressive type of symptoms, which he says, we made us think so, sir. Yes, sir, definitely infective and malignancy would remain the same, sir. Okay. They are, uh, second okay. is Fair. not far below the first not, one, so they are not, mostly yes, similar. Fair. Fair. How do you explain the LV cardiomegaly in this patient? Sir, one, sir, the, uh, one, we could be uh, wrong in, in seeing the cardiomegaly, probably because there was also left side and massive pleural effusion. Two, the LV cardiomegaly, one huge LV hypertrophy can sometimes can shift. And there was also evidence that right side. Uh, 
then how do you explain oh, the lv kind of a cardiomegaly is what i'm asking yeah. Left now, floral effusion. What are the findings? Yeah. Left floral effusion is nothing to do with LV cardiomegaly. Yeah. Left floral effusion has got anything to do with LV cardiomegaly? You, you said it has shifted to the left almost. Yes, sir. Yes. It was to the left with the left-sided floral effusion. Yes, How is yeah. that possible? You mean to say there is some right-sided pushing event as well? Sir, uh, right. Uh, we found dull note on the right, right side. Right side as well, sir. So uh, we were thinking that it could be one of the possibilities that uh, the heart has been pushed to the uh, left by the right pleural effusion, sir. Okay, and you said there was a low pressure TR, yes, but in your diagnosis you had mentioned mild pulmonary hypertension. Yes, How was that? Sir, the the uh, we were not able to find uh, the uh, parastinal heave was only grade one, uh, and there was moderate PVH at least. So we thought uh, because of the react the reactive changes, there would be at least mild PAH in this patient. And it was just against moderate or severe PAH were uh, absence of loud P2 and palpable P2, sir. So the murmur character was typically of uh, low, low pressure. Low pressure PAH. PAH. That's why we summarized it. You say moderate PVH. You said moderate PVH. What is the pulmonary venous pressure? 18 to 20, 25, 25, sir. 18 to 25. Yes. So what do you think will be the main pulmonary artery pressure? Yes, sir. So, uh, if we take, the, we are not considering any uh, capillary changes or pH per se. So, TPG would be around seven, if at all, minimum of seven transpulmonary gradient. So what is the normal 18, transpulmonary gradient? You, it is less than seven, sir. Seven. Hey, doctor, yeah, this thing uh, not may not be in this case. Weight loss and heart failure. What is the other thing you will think? Weight loss and heart failure may not be in this case. Sir, even thyrotoxicosis can present in similar way. Any high output state can, like, because of fever, prolonged fever can itself be presenting like this. Yeah, yes. Dr. Praful said that the commonest cause for weight loss and all this uh, swelling, lymph nodes is still tuberculosis. They tuberculosis. Can See, tuberculosis can coexist with sarcoidosis. It can coexist with uh, your HIV, so many yes. things. Okay, probably, I think uh, this malignancy has to be on the uh, lower priority. Ultimately, it could be same, but uh, as historically, it is always. See, in uh, thyrotoxicosis, you hear that superficial murmur. What is it called? No man's scratch murmur, sir. Okay. Can, uh, yeah, can cardiomegaly be explained by amyloid? Because if it is tuberculosis, how do you explain the cardiomegaly? Um, one thing, uh, though we had percussion, we had the effects corresponding to the left heart border which suggests that there might not be a significant uh, pericardial effusion. Still, uh, pericardial effusion can actually explain the cardiomegaly here. What, what about paradox do you know about... Sorry. Sorry. What paradox do you know about LV cardiomegaly and amyloid? Since we were discussing some paradox, is there anything paradox-wise there? I heard LV, about... LV cardiomegaly LV and amyloid. With regards to LV cardiomegaly of amyloid, what is the paradox that Sir, there are like pa paradox that patient with LVH without hypertension presenting in heart failure? This is one paradox. ECG echo paradox can happen in amyloid. ECG echo paradox, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, ECG examination paradox is possible. Sorry, sir. ECG and examination of LV cardiomegaly, that's possible. A huge cardiomegaly, huge LVH can okay. still okay. Yes. Let us see the ECG. Yes, and let us see your LVH on ECG. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, ECG, uh, normal sinus rhythm with normal standardization at normal speeds, uh, suggest to of right atrial enlargement as well as left atrial enlargement. Uh, there was uh, prolonged PR. The PR was around 200 millisecond. Uh, there was absent Q waves in 1, V5, V6, suggest to of an incomplete LBVB. And there was uh, uh, ECG features which shows poor R wave progression as well as STD changes diffusely. We still don't know the amount of LVH we have, but uh, it could be that there could be an inappropriate uh, low voltage complexes. We would like, actually we have, we know the echo, so this, this was an inappropriately low voltage complexes seen in the ECG. Though by standard definition criteria of low voltages- Can this be a biventricle? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, the, there was, there is R wave in- uh, changes are there. So some little pointer towards Sir, yes, sir. One, there is there appears to be an R-way. R-S-R-dash in V1. V1 as well as biphasic complexes. And it is the right-word axis, no, if at all. 
sir it was rightward access sir around 90 yes, so can this be an ecg of a biventricular enlargement that's what i'm asking yes sir yes sir yes sir yes, yes sir it is so that you should mention no yes sir yes, sir. yes sir. and you started off telling it is a normal sinus rhythm what yes normal sinus rhythm is sorry sir, it was a sinus rhythm i mean not a normal one because the pr was prolonged so another feature so there is the only reason it is not normal sinus rhythm and also because there was tachycardia so it it should be it should say be a it's a normal sinus rhythm sorry sir so, go ahead you, did you mention about the la enlargement yes sir we are mentioned sir the t right. terminal force in v1 is actually there so and uh, the uh, morris index is also more than 0.03 so yes sir there is a left atrial enlargement so with the x-ray uh, pa view uh, was suggest to have apparent cardiomegaly uh, with a uh, we can see that there is fistulal edema both on the left side as well as on the right side which can see this wedge shaped thing and there was evidence of left atrial enlargement by the widened carinal angle there appears to be pericardial effusion uh, though not very clear and also bilateral pleural effusion the apex is not clearly visualized because of the left side massive pleural effusion and uh, uh, the there is silhouting of the right heart border probably there is also an associated consolidation of the right middle lobe and there was also a cephalization of uh, vessels seen So hang on, hang on. Now you tell us now all your differentially as you get each investigation, you should start talking about it. What did the ECG in all your differential diagnosis that you gave? What did the ECG point towards? And now what is the X-ray pointing towards in all this? ECG pointed towards probably an underlying amyloidosis, where we'll have uh, uh, so, inappropriate low voltages and also evidence of some conduction disease as well. Like, I haven't come to echo. You are talking about. Yeah. examination and ecg paradox is that what it is yes sir. we 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 were considering a huge cardiomegaly but uh, there was no evidence showing that there is uh, left ventricular left ventricular hypertrophy go next yeah show the x ray and here so there you not mentioned the tracheal shift to the left yes sir tracheal shift to the right side mild tracheal shift to the right so though ideally we see the upper part where the, the, it is in midline this could probably be a lymph node considering that on examination he had multiple lymph nodes this could very well be a paratracheal lymph node as well but yes there is some shift of the trachea to the right side here what other structure can cause that indentation on the left side sir iot aortic arch can cause indentation like that yeah, good okay so what are all the chambers that are in the, okay sir here the chamber enlargement sir one with respect to right atrium we are not very clear because there is also associated edema and uh, consolidation which is silhouting and with respect to left side also we were not very clear because of the massive pleural effusion but there is left atrial enlargement for sure and uh, chamber enlargement probably we should have got a later x ray to probably better say it but we couldn't get it what, what is this translucent area in the right to lower zone and also just above This one, sir. Ah, yeah. This one, this is, sir. This is actually uh, uh, probably an fistula edema, sir. This appears to be a wedge, which uh, which is pointing more to. This is exactly reverse to that of the wedge-shaped opacity of pulmonary embolisms, where fistula edema can present with wedge which is wider towards the heart and narrower as we go laterally. Similarly, the fistula edema is seen on the left side as well. So, yes, sir. Interlobar. Interlobar fistula edema, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Suggesting very high left atrial pressure. Yes, sir. yes, sir. left atrium okay it's uh, all right fine yes sir so uh, echo uh, this is the apical four chamber view which is showing massive uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy as well as some evidence of right ventricular hypertrophy which is better seen in other views we can also see a granular sparkling appearance of the lv myocardium and the left atrium does, though it is not a very proper view we were not able to get a catch a very good view left atrium doesn't seem to be enlarged the lv inflow appear normal and rv also appear normal in the parasternal long axis view we can also see an associated pericardial effusion along with massive left sided pleural effusion uh these are the color doppler images uh, uh, color wave doppler uh, uh, color doppler across the mitral valve did not show any left inflow obstruction as well as color doppler across the uh, uh, aortic valve did not show any lvot or aortic uh, valve stenosis uh m more showed that the interventricular septal diameter was 27 and posterior wall thickness one second are you impressed with la enlargement what is happening is the la being compressed or what sir uh, one thing yes sir we uh, we so in, even in this you are in an ecg you talked about la enlargement yes, correct yes sir so what is impresses you about the la here 
So we were expecting a we were cross expecting LA enlargement, but we were not able to find any LA enlargement. So How do you explain that? So why is that? Yes. Can L high LA pressure give rise to an ECG finding of an LA enlargement in absence of uh, increase in left atrial yeah. dimension? Sometimes, sir, the high LA pressure, even in the absence, can cause fibrosis of the LA myocardium, which can decrease the conduction. So that, like that, in that way also, sometimes it can produce an LA enlargement apparently. Sometimes they we call it as left atrial force. Okay, in, yes. instead of left atrial enlargement, it could be called as a left atrial force. Yes. So, something what is happening to the LA? No, just go, just go back to the fourth chamber. What is compressing the LA behind? You see, uh, I'm this, I'm yeah, yes, there's something here, right? What is that behind the left atrium? We have confirmed in multiple views. This is a uh, descending thoracic yeah. iota only, ma'am. Even here, it is seen in the plaques view. And this Why is what is this under? Why it is looking compressed? So small. What is the, what do you see here on the uh, right side on on our right side or left of the image? This one. Man. What is here between just behind the LV above this white thing and this man, black man. structure? Yeah. Sorry, something. Please. So what is compressing the LA? You must have confirmed. So something is compressing the LA because ECG echo LV EDP will be very high, yes. right? Yes, so something is compressing, which you would have confirmed on uh, CT probably. Ma'am, one thing which yeah. uh, we were able to see, see was right. there were mediastinal lymph nodes as well. Uh, though there was no any aneurysm of uh, DTA. So probably that might have pushed the iota to the side or something might have caused. Ma'am, we were not very conclusive on what has happened exactly. Yeah, so right, right. Even on the x-ray, you saw that was not the lymph node. That was probably the aortic shadow. So something is... Pushing that, right? Pushing the iota, yeah, the iota is not spherical. It is sort of uh, oval shape. Oval, yes. oval shape, sir. Yes, sir. Compressed on posterior. So X-ray also you had it, and here also. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the uh, interventricular septum was twenty-seven, and the uh, posterior wall thickness was uh, uh, seventeen, and the ejection fraction was thirty-one percent on uh, MO. What about uh, the RV wall thickness? Did you come? We are coming to it, sir. Yeah. We have it, sir. We were showing the left hand. So in the right hand, we can no, see. Here also in that four chamber, you can see it. Right? Yes, sir. There was it RV is, is hypertrophic, hypertrophic, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely yes. hypertrophic. That, so biventricle on the ECG is what you should have been able to say. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right axis with the STTs that you saw and normal voltages otherwise. Right. Sir. In, the, in the precordial leads. Right. So uh, the right ventricular hypertrophy can be well seen here, and, and there was also mild TR. Though this was not a complete envelope to actually this measure. TR, the... you were able to auscultate, is it? Okay. We were able to auscultate, yeah, sir. We attributed the murmur yeah. to this one. Okay. We, we were able to hear, sir. We, it was okay. respectively yes. called it as being a murmur after seeing the echo. After seeing the echo, no, yeah. We were able no, to hear, sir. No, no, no sir. You can't hear this now. Virtual exam. This is the fallacies of virtual examination. Doesn't matter. Does this does this LV dimensions uh, explain your LV apex go down and out? So the uh, Sir, dimensions we probably and in the face of such left huge left pleural effusion. Yes. Your LV apex that you could palpate down and out. Are you sure you did that or you saw? We have done such. No, because we were able to do it. Okay. Again, the, here the TR, uh, though this is not a complete envelope, and uh, probably measuring pressures with this envelope is wrong, but uh, the pressure which we got with this was 22. And this was the RVH, which we were saying, and the RV free wall thickness was around 18 mm. It was seen in the earlier views also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And the uh, 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 TAPSI was around 14.6 uh, uh, mm, the suggestive of some RV dysfunction, though the RV S prime was uh, in the normal range of 10.8. Uh, with respect to the diastolic dysfunction parameters in this patient, we uh, in the LV inflow, pulse wave Doppler, there was actually, because probably because of the underlying first degree heart block as well as tachycardia, there was fusion of E and A wave. We were not able to see them separately. The E wave velocity was 120 centimeter per second. And with respect to the tissue Doppler, similarly, E and A have fused, probably have fused here. The, the, we can see a notch in between them. And the E prime velocity was low of value of 5.1 with uh, the, a ratio of around 26. Uh, value varies significantly. And with respect to one more finding, uh, uh, just go back. Yes, what is happening? Just go behind. Yeah. Uh, what What is happening to all the velocities here? Velocity, yes, ma'am. The uh, the tissue Doppler velocity have significantly decreased. 
the medial e prime was less than uh, seven and all the velocities are reduced right yeah. uh, what are the normal velocities medial medial e prime is taken as seven ma'am and the yeah. lateral e prime 10. 10. but if we, if we want to uh, differentiate a ccp from rcmp the cutoff usually taken for an average is eight centimeter per second here there is no confusion right it's all myocardial yes, so all the velocities all are reduced yes sir and probably this okay. is the most specific sign on echo to differentiate a ccp from rcmp yes. so more this is all myocardial and with respect to because this is some other typical findings we were able to find like as we can see the apex is contracting well with and uh, the uh, base is con uh, the contraction is less and similar thing was uh, even seen on the gls we can see uh, uh, sparing relative sparing of the apex and the mid and the basal part had decreased uh, gls uh, so the typical bullseye plot which is also described on the cherry on the top appearance is also seen here and the mean uh, global longitudinal strain was also decreased with a value of minus 11% and ivc was also dilated with a value of 2.1 though there are respiratory variability was more than 50% uh, and one more typical thing the interatrial septum also appeared to be thickened probably there could be deposition of any any of the infiltration because in the interatrial septum as well and then after echo we went ahead with, uh, to confirm a diagnosis we went ahead with cardiac mri first you have a hello one second now that you have the echo also echo amyloid so why was amyloid not entertained before that was not explained with peripheral neuropathy or what the pain and oh, like sir uh, that's a classical thing now again peripheral sir, neuropathies are known to be in amyloid sir but they are usually generalized they don't happen like this patient okay. presented actually okay. presented with monoplegia and the more, moreover uh, we did not have evidence of autonomic involvement which is very commonly seen in amyloid in this patient and second it was predominantly a motor neuropathy than a sensory neuropathy because sensory neuropathies are more common in amyloid and again typically a left side monoplegia is unlikely to happen in an amyloid it would have been generalized uh, neuropathy is no, no, yes, you had lv hypertrophy you had s4 which was not explained if it was tuberculosis it would have caused ccp right Yes, the apex would not have been the way it was. Yes, ma'am. So it would, uh, would have been infiltrative significant or amyloid. Hmm? Significant cardiomyopathy against CCP, ma'am. Yes, ma so S4 so, and LVH was not explained, right? So it could have been infiltrative or uh, it could have been amyloid. Something undeposited, right? Yes, because there was no murmur. There was no LV outflow obstruction yes, to explain the apex and the LV hypertrophy. Yes, so amyloid should have been inter uh, should have been kept. So. Uh, Cox, amyloid, and this one. Yeah. Ma'am, yes. just it was just because we did not have investigations, we were that's making that's our right. diagnosis after examination. So that's okay. why we brought in those things. Yes, ma'am. After this is, uh, which type of it is? So what you are, I mean, clinically thinking, AL or ATTR, AL type or? Sir, considering the background of malignancy, uh, uh, we would consider an AL type of amyloid, sir. And also yeah. involvement of heart, predominantly yeah. involvement of heart. With amyloid. Cardiac involvement is common in AL, where there is a lot of monoclonal uh, cardiac involvement. Okay. Can this be tuberculosis with amyloid? Yes, sir. Tuberculosis, tuberculosis with amyloid is actually a secondary type, which is AA type of amyloid because of the chronic That's inflammation. Secondary type. So it's yes, not so classical, is it? Not sir. Yes, sir. Good. What first in the di uh, this thing investigative order cmr is better or you'll do a uh, bone bone scans sir uh, bone, sir. bone radionuclide imaging yes sir or? you mean the pyp scan sir pyrophosphate scan well what is first in the order of investigation uh, sir it, it should be a pyp scan in case if you are suspecting it if you if you want all the all the dyskrasias also you will get everything you will get no first sir pyp scan is actually a scan which actually identifies Transthyretin in the heart. It is actually a scan which represents that. So it helps in differentiating an AL type from transthyretin type. So our suspicion of transthyretin amyloid is actually low here. So that's why we. What is CMR to... going to add to the diagnosis? What is important? The scan and the blood investigations, or or the CMR? Yes, sir. Definitely, we, we blood will... blood, blood the first, uh, gamma pathies and all that monoclonal gamma pathies is what you would like to look also. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. blood and blood and scanning in the radionuclide department rather than a CMR. Yes, sir. If you have a choice of doing the two, which one would you do first? Yes, is what blood I scan, scan. Definitely, sir. Definitely. CMR is going to add anything more than what your echo is done. 
what more has cmr added sir uh, again okay. till this point of time we are sure of infiltration but uh, again, again you have the other investigations because we have very yes, sir, we have sir, we have sir, we do cmr have. you can skip go next what is the role of biopsy biopsy we have done that we also sir also. just we were going in the sequence of what we have done you can uh, finish those findings so, sir, because uh, running short of time so oh, the electrophoresis did not reveal any amband or serum pre lichen there was no proteinuria as well uh, pleural fluid showed a translative type of picture montu was negative so we went ahead with the uh, em biopsy so em biopsy actually uh, there are these are the two representative images the lv myocardium actually this is a mass and trichome stain which uh, represents collagen so there was increased deposition of there was fibrosis both uh, in the endocardium as well as in the interstitial regions and this here we can see that there are multiple numerous cells which are actually lymph lymphohistiocytic aggregates these were positive for lc a leukocyte common antigen and cd68 which are positive for histiocytes and there was as i described there was evidence of uh, fibrosis as well but one to our surprise actually congo red stain was negative which is considered almost 100% sensitive congo red stain was negative here and uh, we have also done the cervical lymph node biopsy together with the endocardial biopsy and it, it showed typical dlbcl there was fs9 of the nodular architecture of the lymph node there was capsular breach there were infiltrates outside the lymph node as well and and a definitive diagnosis of diffuse large b cell lymphoma was made and then retrospectively we got the immunohistochemistry done of the endomyocardial biopsy which showed similar immunohistochemistry pattern so all this was actually a lymphocyte uh, lymphohistiocytic infiltration rather than actually amyloid deposition so after these investigations we uh, we uh, made the final diagnosis of history with malignancy bioventricular failure examination showing typical features ecg echo mismatch pseudo infarct pattern conduction disease echo showing gross bioventricular hypertrophy with diastolic dysfunction cherry on the top appearance cervical lymph node suggest to of dlbcl and congo red being negative probably all suggesting tumor cell infiltration we made the diagnosis of dlbcl with stage 4 with b symptoms infiltrate to cardiomyopathy with mojas as described mild tr moderate to uh ph severe bioventricular dysfunction with partial horner and compressive radiculopathy with these symptoms uh, and with this diagnosis we went ahead with uh, treatment uh, with heart with respect to heart failure we started diuretic beta blocker and ac inhibitor though judicial see at a lower doses we have started and six cycles of chemotherapy we were given one thing we made sure is we did not include doxorubicin in our regimen and he was given a rcvp regimen after completion of six weeks of uh, six cycles of chemotherapy patient had is in complete remission and he was totally pain free and there was dramatic response the pleuro pericardial effusion has decreased heart size has decreased and even echo showed improvement in lv function decrease in wall thickness though it did not normalize to the to what we have expected if it had been solely tumor cell infiltration but there was still some granular appearance but definitely the lv wall thickness and all have decreased and LA, we can see la size has regained Sir, Correct. probably sir, the the the, the media. The media what was it? Finally, what is the mystery of the LA being compressed? Ah, what? Probably the media sternal lymph, lymph nodes might have pushed media and media it has caused the compression. Good, good, good. So LV function improved, size has decreased, and even in the M mode, we can see that the wall thickness has decreased from twenty seven to twenty three, and the LV posterior wall decreased to eleven. And will the there be a remission? Decreased. Sorry, sir. Will there be a remission? Patient is in remission. Patient is in remission now, sir. Six cycles of chemotherapy were given, and patient is in remission now, sir. and he is totally symptom free and uh, uh, he is doing well sir what is his prognosis sir Perhaps. prognosis so the so this is a diffuse large b cell lymphoma which is stage 4 and one of the key important parameter in this is cardiac involvement so with respect to cardiac involvement it is actually the mean survival is 1 year one year sir one year sir tell me his prognosis relax relax there will be relax mean survival is 1 year as per literature sir there will be a relapse to follow him up relapse, supposed to follow up adam koi strong good response sir he might be the outlier who had very good response okay that's why right. okay and what was the explanation for this uh, cherry on top <laughs> appearance on the global strain pattern anything you must have written uh, and even, uh, even probably the mystery of this patient is not totally resolved because the lv did not totally normalize and even if we see the granular appearance of the sparkling appearance is still there so some so, amount of so, amyloid So we 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 we, we is on endomyocardial biopsy. We were like because of the sensitivity of endomyocardial biopsy to pick up amyloid is very very good, but still probably this might be that one patient who still had amyloid and probably not picked up any in biopsy. 
probably if he actually re uh, recurs again we were actually planning to repeat an endometrial biopsy and be 100% again sure doubly sure that this is definitely not amyloid super added over tumor cell infiltration so great case uh, congratulations uh, thank you. Good case. very good, good presentation beautifully good worked out yeah thank you very much